Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Sometime back, years ago, in fact, thank you, praise team. Uh, years back, I was studying in the Psalms, and it was talking about clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. <clears throat> and I found that clapping your hands is mentioned quite a bit, not only in the Psalm, but throughout the Bible. So I began to do some study, and then I found out something I really like about clapping your hand during praise and worship. A literal translation. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Literal translation means to scatter and splatter the enemy. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> the first thing that went through my mind when I saw that was I can remember my mother who was very frustrated with a cat that we had and she was always a scat cat and so I'm telling you this morning scat devil and we're going to have business for Jesus amen hallelujah amen <clears throat> thank you Lord thank you Lord <clears throat> we there yeah I want to invite you to be here tonight God in his people is power awaiting. We're living in a very interesting hour. For almost two years, we have been watching and listening to the war between Russia and the Ukraine. And I was somewhat entreated to discover that there was a renegade army that was working with Putin and the Russians against the Ukraine. And I know from your Bible that when this thing is all over with, Russia will be defeated. Then all of a sudden, the people that the, the weird one that was working with Russia against Ukraine has turned around and started attacking Russia, but they have exiled the leader and uh, called some kind of a truce and put that on hold right now and taken all the barricades down around Moscow. And I'm thinking as I look at all of this and listen to all of this, we really are in the last days. Jesus can come at any time. Somebody said, well, if he could come at any time, what's the point in me continuing what I'm doing? The Bible says be to occupy until I come means to be productive till I come. And so that productivity has to do with taking life and making life work, whether it has to do with a job, raising your family, taking care of situation, teen challenge, or whatever. The whole idea is we don't stop. But we have a commission. And our commission is everywhere we go, we're talking about Jesus. I have been entreated for the last several days over the fact that I, have, I keep running into people that are talking about Jesus, people that I wouldn't expect to be talking about Jesus. I had one fellow walk up to me in, a, in, a, in the uh, restaurant the other day, and I'm looking at him thinking, you know, this guy could use a good case of salvation. I'm judging him by the way he looks. And then he comes up to me and starts talking about Jesus. And I backed off real quick, and I thought, I need to change my attitude real quick. I need to judge by the Spirit and not by the outward appearance. Hello? How many of you are full of God? Mm, 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 mm. The message I want to share with you this morning is this. These are the last days. Turn to me in your Bibles, if you will. I want to touch on a couple of scriptures. This first one is very common to us. Mark chapter 16. There's the clothes. Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven. He's been crucified, resurrected. He has spent 40 days with his followers, giving them final instructions. And so beginning reading in verse... You know, uh, let me try this. I'm going to start with verse 15. And he said to them, go. Everybody say go. go. How many of you in the going mood? The church has been sitting long enough. It's time for the church to go. 
I didn't get an amen out of that one at all. Got a couple of people nodding their head, and that was about it. Verse 15, and said to them, Go into all the world. The word world there means social order. In other words, your world. Now, God may send you into somebody else's world before it's all over with, but you start in your own little world. Preach, proclaim, and declare good news gospel to every being. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, here's something I want to tell you. It is not our job to save people. That's his business. I can't save them, you can't save them. We can lead people through the plan of salvation. And we're good at praying the prayer of what we call the prayer of salvation. You're going to find it very difficult to find the prayer of salvation in your Bible. Salvation is an action. And yes, you have what you say. Don't, get, don't misunderstand me. And keep leading people through the prayer of salvation, as you call it. But my friend, change is what spells salvation. When I turn from the old man to the new man, when the devil's not running my life anymore and the Holy Spirit's running my life, I've been born again. But the main thing you want to understand is while you're sowing seed and witnessing, you don't have to worry about the consequences. Let the Word and the Holy Spirit take care of the consequences. You just keep broadcasting. Be a good steward. Amen? These signs, verse 17, these signs, these works, this proof will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents. And I like this. Um, years ago, we had some Bible college students interning here, and one of them's name was Jason. And Jason was very new to the full gospel movement, but he knew it was real and he wanted to be a part of it, and he had enrolled in a full gospel Bible college. But he didn't understand some of these scriptures, and he read that about uh, taking up serpents, okay? And so uh, Jason said, do people actually do that? My youth pastor told him, well, at Victory they do that all the time. I didn't know that had happened until some time had passed. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. You didn't tell him that. Yes, I did. And I found out that the, Jason was terrified of snakes. And he had been coming to church for several weeks there, driving in from campus, mortified that we might be pulling out a snake. Well. It just so happened that one of the youth gave me a paper sack that had this little gizmo on the inside that you wind up. And if you bump the paper sack, it sounds like a rattlesnake. And definitely led by the spirit of buffoonery. I called Jason over in the guest study, and I said, Jason, and I handed him the sack. I said, I want you to take it on the platform with me, and when I asked you for it, bring it to me. He's walking with that sack like this. All the color in his face was gone. And as he's coming up the back step to come on the platform, he bumped the wall and set that little critter off like that. He went one way and the bag went the other way and they had to catch him out here. I didn't feel terrible at all. 
This corner over here is after my height already. <laughs> I attended Jason's graduation at Sagu. And as he was coming across the stage, he had picked up a nickname. And the president of the college was reading his name. I can't remember his last name, we'll just say Hudson. And the president of the college said, J Snake Jason Hudson. Everybody on campus knew who Snake Jason was. Isn't that mean of me? Yeah. <laughs> now, you say, Preacher, why did you do that? Just to get you to laugh a little bit, okay? But the thing I really want to do is this. Why is that scripture there? Is it really talking about taking up snakes? Well, I have to tell you, the Apostle Paul got bitten. Doing a good deed, helping to build a fire. He was getting wood. It was winter time, and the heat and everything from the campfire, I guess, was thawing it out, and there was a snake there in hibernation. He was warming up and moving around, and Paul reaches in there to get a piece of wood to put on the fire, and the snake bites him. And Paul shook him off and kept right on his business. And the people looking at him and seeing what kind of a snake it was, they expected him to drop dead just like that, and he didn't. Then they presumed he was a god. He said, no, I'm not a god. I'm a child of a king. Hello? You understand what I'm saying? I want you to know this. Do not let the snakes of life slow you down. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Keep on going. Don't get distracted. You know you're on a mission. You know you're doing what God called you to do. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. The enemy is trying to distract all of us at all times. Don't put up and don't allow. Amen? Yes. However, this passage of Scripture brings something else to my mind. And if you look at it closely, you remember that Jesus made a statement one day. He called a group of people vipers. He called them snakes. What in the world was he talking about? He was talking about those hypocritical religious people. We don't have any here. We were talking about those hypocritical Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were fair, you see. But anyway, they were, they were nitpickers, you know. When it came to tithing, they didn't believe in just tithing 10% of your money. If they had a, a, a tomato patch out there, they went out there and started pulling tomatoes or cucumbers. Every tenth one, they tithed to the Lord. They even tithed mint leaves. You know, you make tea and then you can take mint and put it in the tea and all that. They would eat, you know, and God said, you're, you're religious, but you don't have a relationship. And what he's saying is this, folk, we're living in an hour when the church world in general had become religious. Shake it off. Don't get caught up with it. I'm gonna, you're slowing down on me already. I'm not even finished reading my scriptures. Ooh. All right, I'll try, I'll try. Verse 18. They shall destroy or do away with religious influence contrary to the word of God. Is basically what that's actually saying. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. Nowhere does it say heal the sick, it says, I mean, uh, pray for the sick, it says heal the sick. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I want to ask you this, do you believe that you have God in you? Yes. Do you believe that you could have some more of God in you? Yes. Everybody's shaking your head yes. So when God came to you, you just got a piece of him, is that right? Yes. Absolutely not, you got all of him, okay? And so what happens is if when we talk about, I need more of God, I need more of God, what you're actually saying is I need to recognize and utilize what I have, okay? I understand what you're saying, but we've got all these religious terms and everything, and it cheats us out of a demonstration of the power of God. I want to tell you something right now. You see this hand? Is this my hand or God's hand? It's our hand, right? You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. 
I'm not the healer, he's the healer, but he's in me. Everybody put your hand out like this. That's his hand. Everything you do with that hand, you're doing it to him. Everything you do with that hand, you're doing it with him. Some of you need to stop doing some of the stuff you're doing. Amen. Hallelujah. The next time you're washing dishes, say, thank you, Jesus, for helping me wash the dishes. Come on. But here's the thing I want you to do. Turn around and put your hand on somebody. You just put Jesus on them. Somebody said, whew, I felt that. Never mind. All right. Verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And I have taught you this as well, that the right hand and the left hand is very important. If it was a king or a pharaoh, if you look at a picture of a king or a pharaoh, you'll find that they have something in both hands. If you're looking at a pharaoh or even a king sometimes, you'll see them with their hands crossed like this. And you come before them to plead your case. And when the king or the pharaoh does this, that means he's heard all he wants to hear, shut up. He's about to make a decision. In his right hand is the rod, in his left hand is the staff. Both of them speak of power and authority. If he stretches out his right hand toward you, that means that you are a guilty individual. If he puts his left hand out toward you, that means he's going to let you go free. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father and said, All power and authority is given unto me, and I give it to you. You understand what I'm saying? And so I want to know something. If, if God can't lie, then I can stretch forth my hand in the name of Jesus, and people will be healed. People will be set free. I'm, I'm telling you, folks, we are living in a moment that's very critical to us understanding the power of God in our lives. It's time for us to wake up. It really is. It really is. It really is. Thank you, Lord. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. So be it. Amen. So be it. I have one other passage of scripture I'll quickly read. That's Galatians chapter 6. And I'll begin reading. I think I'm going to start reading in verse 7. You know, it's, the whole thing is good. It really is. For example, verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. I went into Walmart. James Carroll was there working. James teaches one of our Sunday school classes. And he was, he was sharing with me some of the things that God doing in his life. And about that time, another employee comes around the corner and James calls him over and introduces him and introduces me to him as a pastor. And this young man started talking immediately about Kay Morris over here. And he said, Pastor, between James and Kay, I'm getting goosebumps. Something's going on there. And he said, and that woman read my mail. He said, I'm thinking about coming to church Sunday night. So we're going to be looking for him Sunday night. But here's the whole deal. Go into your world, your social order whether it's in the neighborhood, whether it's on the telephone, right now is the time for you to begin to minister to people. There is a harvest of souls about to take place. I'm talking about an explosion. I'm telling you, people, you're not going to recognize this church or any other church in about 12 months if we last that long because God is about to turn the church upside down. He's about to set his people on fire. There is a harvest of souls about to take place and you and I are going to have to disciple those people and we need all the Bible knowledge we can get. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so I'm reading on verse 7. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will always reap. Also reap. And I, I, I grew up under my mother's teaching on that verse. She was, every time I messed up, she said, you're going to reap what you sow, boy. And so it was always a negative with me, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reap all this bad stuff that I've been sowing. No, no, no. How many of you can plant good stuff? You plant good seed, you're going to reap good stuff. You plant bad seed, you're going to reap bad stuff. And folk, I had to tell you, I don't, I don't sow thorns anymore. I don't throw, uh, sow vines and junk food anymore. I sow good seed. I sow the Word of God. I sow life. I sow joy. I sow peace. How many of you know what I'm talking about there? Hallelujah. Hmm. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Holy Spirit will of the Holy Spirit reap everlasting life. Verse 9 is very important for this hour. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season. Kairos is the Greek word there. And kairos means at the strategic right moment. To make a move. At the strategic right moment to make a move, we shall reap if we do not give up, lose heart, cave in, or quit. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I had you earlier going around and ministering to one another. We started the service off different and everything because I wanted to emphasize this one verse. Folk, every moment of your life, Minister to other believers. Do not take anybody for granted. Minister to your brother and sister. I want to tell you, especially with you men, most men go through their life, day by day, week after week, month after month, rarely having physical contact with people. Some of that is their fault, okay? That's the nature of a man to kind of pull away and put walls up and everything, more so than a woman. A woman is more affectionate. Women minister to women better and more effectively than men minister to men. But I'm telling you right now, if there ever was a time when we need a brother, we're living in an hour when right now when we need a brother. So everybody, love on your brother. Amen? Am I doing all right so far? <laughs> I, I, I really didn't come up here just to preach a sermon. I'm coming up here to tell you what's in my heart. In my heart, I am feeling that we are on borrowed time. I'm feeling in my spirit that things are about to change and change quickly. And we are being caught up in stuff, distractions of all kinds, whether it be physical or financial or family, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a distraction that keeps us from saying, this is what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to me right now, and this is the way I should be moving. A moment ago, I had you to just... Shut, shut yourself away with God and listen and see what the Holy Spirit had to say. Now, I asked a question a while ago when we were doing that. How many of you actually felt I didn't get a thing? Okay. And some of you are brave enough to raise your hand. Most of you are not. Okay. How many of you felt that, hey, I did get something? A few of you did. The rest of you are noncommittal. Okay, the whole deal is this: God is talking to you right now. Yes, yes, he is. yes I'm talking to you, and hopefully, some of the stuff I'm saying will stick with you more than five minutes after you leave here. But the truth is, the most important thing for you today is to hear from God yourself. And when you walk out of this building, you should have something in your heart. Thus saith the Lord. Spend your time looking for that. And don't let a day go by that you don't get something. And as you do it, you'll get more and more and more, okay? But if you just get one word, walk with one word. But listen to the Holy Spirit because God's talking to you. Everybody in this room, I don't care how spiritual or unspiritual you are, God is talking to you this very minute. And this is why, go ahead. This is why in Revelation, the seven churches of Asia, every one of them ends with a statement, let him that hath an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. He is talking to you right now. God help us to have an ear to hear what 
the Spirit of God is saying. Now, let me talk to you along this line. COVID was a bad thing. And it was man-made. We cannot change what has happened in the past. We can change our tomorrows. And we start right now. But with that said, what I'm seeing in the religious community, the church community, is that the churches are having fewer services. Right now, 40% of the churches haven't even started back to being on anything but online. And yet your Bible tells you that the closer we get to the end and the return of Christ, to forsake not the assembling of yourself together. I'm amused at the fact that some people have a problem tithing, and yet those same people will pay hundreds of dollars to buy a ticket to go hear some ungodly group or some sport event taking place. Folk, I want to ask you where your values are when that sort of thing starts happening, okay? I, I, I've, I've, I know I've quit preaching and gone to meddling, okay? But the thing is this, we are living in an environment that's very much to the days of the early Christian. When Rome was having its problem, Rome began to do the Crusade Wars, uh, the, cru- uh, the, uh, uh, the, Oly- the Greeks were doing the Olympics, but the Romans were having the arena built and they were bringing all the people in and they had the uh, boys out there cutting up each other and killing each other. Then they found out it was a lot of fun to burn Christians at the stake and feed them to the line. And the people were just, they were going for the sport of seeing all this kind of stuff going on because it kept their mind off of the real issue that was going on in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire did collapse. I want you to know, not just the United States, but everything on this planet right now is going to collapse. Every government, every financial structure, every situation that's contrary to the mm-hmm, Slow down, preacher. It will collapse. And I want you to know that there's a season there where the Antichrist comes on the scene and he says, I have the solution. And for three and a half years, it looked like he does. But I'll tell you again, folks, we won't be here. We're out of here. You got it. I hear you over there. We're out of here. But my, my thing is this. I have friends, I have loved ones that I care about their salvation. I want to make sure they're ready for heaven. But what about the guy I don't know? I'm driving down the highway... And I see a guy walking, a young man. I see the young man walking, and I can tell by his persona and everything, he's homeless. And, and I, you know, I just say, Lord, help him, bless him. And then I come out of the church to get in the car, and I look down here in the prayer garden, and there he sits on one of the benches. Well, I have an appointment, so I get in the car to go to my appointment. And as I'm going away... I have this guilt complex or whatever coming over me. Why didn't you go talk to him? Why didn't you go talk to him? And so I said, okay, God, I'll go talk to him. I got an appointment, but you know what the situation is. So I turned around and came back, but he was gone. It was frustrating. That afternoon, I saw him again. And so I passed him. I turned around to go back to him. He's not there. So I missed, I tried three different times before the day was over with to find this young man and minister to him, and I wasn't able to do it. And all that time I kept asking myself the question, what if? What if? Folks, let me tell you something. If you have opportunity, take it right then. Don't postpone it, okay? Uh, The famine of the gospel, when I say that, the sermons that are being preached today whether it's in the media or from the pulpit or sometimes on the street, are not gospel. A lot of it has to do with uh, intellect, reasoning, uh, self-help messages, how to get out of this problem, get out of that problem, how to fix your marriage, how to fix your finances, how 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 to pray. Let me tell you something. Did anybody, I'll look out here at the men first, How many of you men are or have been married? Did anybody teach you how to court? Somebody over here got their hand up. Most of you are saying, "Uh uh-uh. 
Isn't it amazing how we learn how to do that on our own? How many of you men, well, let's just try everybody on that. Uh, how many of you went and took a class on how to kiss? Some of you needed a class on how to kiss. But the whole deal is you got in there and you learned the hard way. I'm for real, believe it or not, okay? <laughs> but the whole deal is this. Our relationship with God, yes, there is people that can mentor and disciple you. And yes, you have your Bible. But the thing is this, when it comes to building a love relationship with God, I cannot teach you how to love God. That is something you're going to have to do. And until you have a love relationship with Him, you will always have questions. What if kind of questions. Folk, I want to tell you, it's time for us to fall in love with Jesus. The first point of my message is simply this. This is breakout day for the miraculous. Breakout day for the miraculous. Our young people are growing up in a high-tech world. They're not easily impressed with an old-fashioned book called a Bible. I'm doing something right now that um, I normally do not do, but I feel God wants me to do it. I'm counseling a young boy that's about 11 years old. And I think he's blessing me far more than I'm blessing him. And I pulled my Bible out and I realized that he had his phone. And I wanted to give him a scripture. He said, hold on there. And in a few minutes, he had it on his phone. And I realized that if I put my Bible down and picked up my phone, he could identify with me quickly. And so here we are playing back and forth on the phone. We've got a lot of pastors doing that in the pulpit with their iPads or what have you. I can't wait until the iPad crashes. <laughs> I'm bad, aren't I? God, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I can look it up, but I need to hook it up. You understand me? I can look it up any day. I need to hook it up. What if they take the Bibles away from us? What if, they, what if somebody found a button that would make all the electronics crash? The other thing we're dealing with is artificial intelligence. I have a, a gizmo in my house and I can say, Hey Google, what's the temperature outside? And he answered me, the temperature in Hazel, Texas is such and such. My wife and Mike and I were sitting at the table talking about artificial intelligence. I turned around and said, hey, Google, are you artificial intelligence? He said, yes, I am. I said, do you have emotions? He said, I would like to think so. Ah, but that is an emotion, isn't it? That's what Google said. Artificial intelligence is a detrimental thing in the long run, folk. I'm t I, I don't. I, I know some of you are looking at me like, "What planet did you get off of this morning?" You know, I know that. But I'm here to tell you that we are living in a different world, and what worked 50 years ago is not working today. What, uh, uh, but the whole idea is what we have done is we have substituted gimmicks for the power of God. We've got the flashing lights, the smoke bombs, and all that kind of stuff going on. We've got all the modern technology and all this kind of stuff. 
I don't know where to stop or quit or what else. I, I, don't, I don't know. I was in nightclub business for a while. Do you know why we turn the lights off in the club? To hide our iniquity. Why do we turn the lights off in church? Point two. Simon, what do you think of this preacher this morning, you know? <laughs> I'm all right. Oh, he gave me a thumbs up on it. Yeah, yeah, all right. Point two. Pentecostalism, for whatever that means, is returning to the church. Pentecostalism, for whatever it means, is returning to the body of Christ. I want to make three statements on that. Number one, Jesus did not permit his followers to begin their ministry until they were clothed with power. Folk, you cannot deal with this fallen world in the natural. They have tried medical science, they've tried drugs, they've tried entertainment, they've tried alcohol, they've tried... and none of that works. But I want you to know this, that when Philip went down to Samaria and preached Jesus, His preaching was confirmed with signs and wonders. You came here for one reason, to be healed. When you said, I'm going to go to that church to be healed, it was already done. You have what you say. Amen? And I say the same thing. My sister in the back came to this church. She was told, you go to victory, you'll get healed. She came, and the day that she made the decision to come is the day her healing is manifest. And folk, it's time for us to begin to say thank you. Thank you for healing my body. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for straightening my mind out. Thank you for getting the junk out of me. Come on, give God praise all over the room right now. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Philip was preaching to the Samaritans. There was all kinds of issues that could have been a reason to stop that revival, if you want to call it that. But when I say Pentecostalism, what I'm talking about is a demonstration of the power of the Word of God. PowerPoint, that is point two, Pentecostalism is returning to the church. I want you to recognize that Jesus said, go. And Jesus also said, but first, tarry until you be endued with power from on high. I want you to know something. That tarrying does not mean to sit and wait. It means start being productive. It, the the, the uh, Greek word tarry there is also translated to marry or to come in union or agreement with. Folk, if there ever was a time for me to agree with God, I need to agree with him now. Every moment of my life should be an agreement between me and God. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I need to come in agreement with him on what's happening there. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. All right, so that was my first point. My second point, along with Pentecostalism, is that we are seeing on our college and uh, school campuses a stirring. Uh, we uh, just recently talked about Ashbury and uh, Brother Clay went down to his alma mater to be a part. He was a part of the Jesus movement back in the uh, uh, 70s. I'm a part of the Jesus movement from back in the 70s. The thing I want you to understand is that was not man-made. It was a God thing. 
two plus three plus four plus four plus People, in one moment, right here now, God can take over this service. I had a black lady preaching for me, a revival here a few years back. Wilder was doing an awesome job. Some people don't like women preachers. I like women preachers. We let them raise our babies, keep our nursery, teach Sunday school class, cook our food, wash our clothes, wipe our nose. Bless God, they can preach too. <laughs> Should the men do the preaching? Absolutely. Why don't, let's, let's, why don't we all do it? Amen. It was Sunday night. And in those days, I had, that was back when I had the uh, college interns here. We had them all on the platform. You know how you used to, the preacher used to sit on the platform, okay? So we had them all on the platform. And everybody wants to be a part of the show. And so Wilder just walked down the road, boom, 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 boom. Didn't say anything, just, just touching people. All those guys fell on the floor, except me. Well, you know, I've got to stay here to make sure the service goes the way it's supposed to go. And she looked at me and she said, you too. And hit me on the head and I hit the floor right there. And I stayed there for an hour and a half. And God showed up. It's amazing how God shows up when we get out of the way. Are you still with me? It is time for pastors to recognize the time factor is not important. The order of service is not important. The presence of God is important. And suddenly, and suddenly, because they were in one accord, and suddenly, because they were tarrying, marrying, coming together, being as one, God showed up. All through my Bible, and suddenly, and suddenly, I read it over and over and over, suddenly. And I'm telling you this morning, whether it's this morning, whether it's tonight, or in one of these services, it's going to be sudden, and suddenly the Holy Spirit's going to take over, and everybody in this room, I don't care if you're that spiritual or this spiritual, every single one of you are going to find yourself in the presence of Almighty God, experiencing something you've never had before, and you may not be able to love a child. Oh, glory to God. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. The Holy Spirit <clears throat> turned Peter the weak into Peter the bold. Don't say you can't. Every single one of us need to step it up today. The third point I want to make about Pentecostalism is that the spiritual gifts are about to be on public display like never before. <clears throat> I like what my, my godson and pastor over at First Assembly in Dallas said here in the pulpit a few weeks back. You don't need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. You need it to go to Walmart. And that's true. Every time I go into Walmart, I wind up ministering to people. I never can go to Walmart and leave without ministering to somebody. It used to aggravate me, and then God said, hey... What did I call you to do? Go shopping? You understand what I'm saying? My steps are ordered of the Lord. Wherever I go, wherever I go, Whataburger, it doesn't matter. I believe that I have a divine appointment there. We went to Alphabies a year ago, met a server. I believe his name is Christian, too. I like that. I've got a Christian here, and he's a Christian. Amen. But he and I connected, and we got to talking with him. And he enrolled in college, I think he's in Baylor. And then uh, 
He goes off to school, well, summer's here, and I look across the room, and there he is. He's back working at Applebee's during the summer, you know, to pay for school and what have you. And he came over and he said, and you're a pastor, aren't you? And I said, yeah, where's your church? I said, well, it's in Azel. Are you familiar? I live in Azel. I said, oh, okay. Uh, you know where Sonic is? Everybody knows where Sonic is. I said, well, we have living water. We're right across the street. So I'm expecting him to show up. You understand what I'm saying? Everywhere you go, there's people hungry for something. They're looking for something. I believe Jason will be here tonight. You know what I mean? I believe he'll be here tonight, and he's going to get his needs met. And so I'm looking at the spiritual gift on display. We're teaching on this in Wednesday night, and guys in Teen Challenge, we've been talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and we're moving into the gift of Spirit and everything. Folk, it's time for us to stop talking about it. It's time for us to stop teaching about it. It's time for us to get into it. Yeah. Amen. 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 I believe that God wants to fill everybody here fresh, full, and new. Whatever you have in your relationship with God, there's more. I mentioned a while ago how many of you could use more of God. We were raising our hand because we can all feel like, yeah, I need more of God. The thing is, if I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit was a part of that. The Holy Spirit is the reason we got saved. The Holy Spirit is what brought us under conviction. The Holy Spirit is what brought us into the kingdom of God. And it was God the Father involved in that with his love. He loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So you didn't, you didn't get just a little piece of God when you got saved. You got all of God. Amen. You're full of God tonight. This morning, you got the God the Father in you, you got God the Son in you, you've got God the Holy Spirit. Now, my question is Has God got you? You may have the Holy Spirit, but has the Holy Spirit got you? You may have Jesus, but has Jesus got you? I want all of God. Yes, you do. I do too. But the thing is, He wants all of me. He wants all of you. Are you ready to make that kind of commitment? He did. He didn't hold back. Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. He told his disciples, this is the Father's will. I have to do this. And when he cried out from the cross, it is finished. He completed the whole program of restoration that gives you and me victory here this morning. Give God praise. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so my third point here, spirit-led worship and demonstration of the Lord will be the norm. <clears throat> and what I'm talking about is this. Spirit-led worship. I have to be careful because I don't want to offend anybody that's part of the praise team. That's not my deal. I thank God for the people that are on the platform. But, folk, too much of our praise and worship is man-made. What you're listening to in the contemporary music, boy, I, you know, I don't want to be offensive. I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or offend anybody, but I just really, really need to say some things. Praise and worship in the contemporary mode for a lot of the churches, okay, is taken off radio, CDs, and we mimic what the artists did. Most of, the, and Hillsong was no different. Most of what we're hearing in our gospel praise and worship today are feeling songs written by people who learned to play a guitar in their bedroom with very little understanding of music theory and, pardon the expression, hemonology. It got real quiet, didn't it? <laughs> I 
I believe music styles change, no problem. But here's my thing. When was the last time you broke out in a song that had never been recorded? It was birthed in your spirit under the Lord. The Hebrew songbook called Psalms are spontaneous. Church praise and worship is not a concert. But it's something where we all get in. And we're all singing. And we're all clapping our hands. And we're all shouting. And we're all dancing. And I think it's time to get some Pentecostalism back into our dancing too. <laughs> I figured that one might work. Oh boy. I'm going to have to ask the ushers to help me out the back door so I survive this morning, I'm telling you. Mm. But true spirit-led worship brings joy, peace, awe, and healing. Healing. I've been in too many services where right in the middle of praise and worship, people would get healed all over the room. Come to the altar weeping, surrender their heart and life to Christ. I want to get back into a service where the Holy Spirit is the song leader, where the Holy Spirit is the preacher, and where the Holy Spirit is the people. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So why are we here today? I don't know what you came to do. But I just came to praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Stand with me, please. Thank you, Lord. Would you do me a favor and just kind of worship the Lord with me for a moment? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be. Shout to 